So uh, where were we last time? Um, so we argued that there should be an equality between the state created by acting with two local operators on the vacuum and regular polarization, and some sum over primaries and descendants. Um, and by the state operator correspondence, this actually is an equality between operators. So here the momentum generator just becomes a derivative with respect to the position of this uh, operator on the right hand side. Prime of x12 
derivative with respect to x2 um, of this two point function of k prime of x2 of k of x3. Um, and the two point function is fixed by conformal invariance, and we can choose if we like uh, an orthogonal basis of operators um, so that uh, this is just the, the two point coefficient is just uh, delta k prime k. Um, and then, of course, this is over uh, x23 to the 2 delta k. Um, so this is, this is completely fixed. And the result of that is it picks out one term in the sum. So we just get c i j k of x12 2, 2, 1 over x23 to the 2 delta k. Um, but the left hand side, we also know. Um, this is also fixed by conformal invariance. This is just f i j k, those coefficients, um, times x12 to the delta 1 plus delta 2 minus delta 3 times uh, cyclic permutations of that factor. Okay? So this was fixed by the conformal word identities, and this is fixed by the conformal word identities, um, and this determines what this thing is. Um, in particular, you can work uh, in an expansion in X12 uh, match both sides, and you'll be able to figure out what, what this is. Um, and just, just so you have some explicit formulas to stare at, um, let's consider the case uh, where delta i equals delta j, and I'll just write delta k is delta to make the formula simple. So then the claim is that c i j k of x comma derivative is f i j k x to the delta minus 2 delta phi. And then it has some power series expansion where the first term is uh, x dot del, and then there are some other terms and so on. Um, so uh, if you'd like, uh, as a challenge, you can try to determine, find alpha and beta. Um, and alpha and beta will just be some rational functions of the of, uh, delta. Um, but it's already useful to have this to stare at because we can we can see a few properties of these coefficients. So the first statement is that um, it's proportional to a three-point coefficient in the theory, f by jk is constant, um, and that just multiplies the whole thing. The rest is uh, independent of the three-point coefficients, it just depends on the dimensions. Okay. Um, uh, another observation is this factor up front. Um, you could have guessed what this was um, from dimensional analysis. So, uh, in our formula here, um, uh, OI has length dimension minus delta I. This is length dimension minus delta J. This is length dimension minus delta K. And so you need something with uh, x to, to the appropriate power in order to make dimensional analysis work. So this thing needs to go like x to the delta k minus delta i minus delta j minus something dimensionless. Any questions? Okay, good. So, right, so the, the OPE is an extremely useful tool for doing computations uh, in a CFT. Um, and uh, in particular, it lets you reduce any endpoint function of the theory. Um, 
and then you can repeat this. You can iterate this procedure and eventually get down to one point functions. And um, I actually didn't even talk about one point functions because they, they, uh, um, they seem too simple. But uh, they're, they're very easy. So um, what is the one point function of O of x in the CFT? Zero. Why is it zero? Right, good, okay, yeah. Everyone's shouting out symmetries, that's right. All the symmetries are responsible for making it zero, particularly when there's no scale. So by dimensional analysis, it's zero. Um, except, there's an exception. You could have a constant. You could have a constant. So it's one for the unit operator, and zero otherwise. Um, and this is true on, um, on any space that's conformally equivalent. to flat space. Um, the nice thing about the OPE is actually uh, you can still use it to do computations on manifolds that aren't conformally equivalent to flat space, as long as they're conformally flat, hopefully. Um, and the only difference is, so this, this whole procedure still works. Um, on some other type of manifold, you'll just have a different formula for the one point function. So as an example, um, a nice example, if you think about a, a thermal field theory, which would be a theory on, um, on S1 uh, cross Rd minus 1, then by dimensional analysis, um, the one-point functions would just be proportional to 1 over the, uh, the length of the circle to the delta, or temperature to the delta. Um, so I predict that the OPE works in that case as well. Yeah, this, uh, this, uh, that's right. Yeah. So so this analysis is just for local operators, and, and in particular, I'm specializing to local operators in these nice informal multiplets that we've been discussing. Um, there are versions of the OPE that involve extended operators, um, uh, although not. Uh, um, not necessarily all possible combinations of extended operators. Um, so if you like, uh, you can ask me about that after the lecture. I'd be happy to tell you more. Um, other questions? Okay. Good. So the existence of the OPE establishes establishes this claim that I made earlier that the two-point functions and three-point functions are really all, all there is. Uh, and, and the two-point functions, three-point functions, and dimensions are all there is to, uh, to the data of the CFT. Um, all endpoint functions are just determined in terms of those quantities. Um, and uh, so in particular, we can look at a four-point function. And for simplicity, let's restrict to a four-point function of identical scalar operators. Um, and let's just work out uh, in detail this procedure for this case and see what happens. Um, so on the one hand, we uh, argued using the word identities that this has to be a function of conformal cross ratios times some factors to soak up the scaling dimensions. And remember, these cross ratios are u is x12 squared, x34 squared over x1 3 squared, x2 4 squared, uh, and v is u with 1 and 3 swapped. Uh, so on the one hand, um, we know this by the word identities. On the other hand, we can actually compute this thing using the OPE. Um, so what is, the, what is the form of the OPE for two scalars? So it's a sum over operators in the theory. We have some three-point coefficients. Um, and then some differential operator um, that 
is independent of the three-point coefficients and just depends on the dimensions. So I'm using a different convention now. I'm going to factor out, explicitly factor out the three-point coefficients in the LPD. And another thing I'm going to do is um, be a little bit more careful um, uh, about the fact that the operators can have spin. So in the previous discussion, I was suppressing spin indices, but in principle, you can have operators of spin appearing here, and then these uh, differential operators, C, have some indices that you need to contract with them. Um, and we need a, we need a quick uh, lemma. So claim that um, if O appears in the OPE of phi with phi, so that's what this notation means, then O is a symmetric traceless tensor. So that means that O just has a bunch of uh, vector indices that are symmetrized uh, and traceless. Um, and uh, there's, a, there's a nice quick proof of this claim, uh, which is to think about the three-point function phi phi O. Um, and by using the formal transformations, I can arrange for all three operators to live on a line. Let's put O in the middle and phi on the other side just for fun. Okay, so I can arrange for all three operators to lie on a line. Um, and this configuration is then invariant under the rotations around this line. Okay, so there's some additional SO D minus 1 of rotations around the line. And so that means that this correlator had better be an invariant tensor of S of D minus 1. So uh, if you think about it, what that means is that the if I take the, so the S of D representation of O, and I restrict it to the S of D minus 1 singlet subspace, that subspace had better be non-trivial. Um, and this is true if and only if O is a symmetric traceless tensor. So any other type of representation of SOD doesn't have this property. Um, and there is another fact, which is that L has to be even. Um, and this you can see by thinking about invariance under this transformation. In this case, I take, it's a, if I take the phi's to be identical, then the three-point function has to be invariant under this kind of flip. And if you write down the possible form of three-point functions for this, uh, um, for this, these types of uh, operators, um, uh, you find that invariance under this flip requires that L has to be even. Yes. Pardon? Good. So conformal symmetry. So it didn't matter what positions they were at um, originally. You could always use conformal transformations to put, put them all on the line. That's right, yeah. So if you have if you have more than three, then you can't put them all on a line. Um, so basically, it, any three points can be mapped to any other three points using conformal transformations. And that's because there are no conformal cross ratios associated with three points. Other questions? So by the way, if, if this was a little too abstract, so the idea is that if we have a symmetric traceless tensor, um, and uh, we, um, uh, then this statement that if you restrict to uh, S of D minus 1, um, th then there should be an invariant subspace. So that's just O1111. If you just set all the indices equal to one value, where that one value is the value that's fixed by this SOD minus one. Okay, so that's the single. Okay, good. So we can be a little bit more specific about um, about the form of this. So B, this A index, which was just a general index for SOD, is actually a collection of of mu indices, symmetric mu indices. Okay, but we won't we won't actually need Quite that much detail. So, so this is the form of the OP. So now let's actually uh, use it to do to do this computation. So let's take let's take our operators and let's do the OPE between pairs like this. So the result is we get a double sum 
uh, one sum for each OPE that we do. We have our three-point coefficients. And then our differential operators. And then finally, this two-point function. But the two-point function is fixed by conformal invariance. And I didn't write in detail what the formula is for operators with spin. But essentially, there's just some tensor um, whose form is fixed by conformal invariance and then divided by x24 to the 2 delta O. Um, and we can take, if we like, an orthonormal basis of operators um, such that the two-point function vanishes unless O equals O prime. So this is fixed by conformal invariance. And we just saw from the above that these things are also fixed by conformal invariance. Um, so the result is because of this uh, Kronecker delta, the double sum collapses to a single sum now of squared OPE coefficients um, times some thing which is fixed by conformal invariance. Um, and this thing is explicitly oh, and let me um, let me just in the definition of this thing, let me pull out some conventional factors. Okay, so I'll divide by those factors and then I'll multiply by them again the definition of this thing. And then this is just our differential operator. <coughs> times this fixed function. Each of these things is fixed by conformal invariance, so this thing is fixed by conformal invariance. And the thing is called a conformal block. Um, okay, so... So we get a bit of an intuition um, exercise. So we computed this thing. So using, using our expression for that, show that g for a scalar is equal to u to the delta over 2 times 1 plus subleading terms in. Uh, as x1 goes to x2. So this, uh, you, might, you might be able to do, I mean, it's just a couple lines of algebra. I encourage you to try it. Um, one interesting thing that we should notice about this formula is that um, uh, whereas here we have all these x12s, x34s, and stuff floating around, um, actually the result is just a function of the cross ratio. Um, and this is actually true, uh, more generally, of this, this thing. G delta L uh, is just a function of U and V. Um, so so why, why is that? Um, and answering why will give us a slightly nicer way to think about what these conformal blocks are, and that will lead us to a way to actually compute them. Okay, so so what what is this thing that uh, that we defined here? So this conformal block divided by these factors um, So what we actually did is we, we took a four-point function uh, And we isolated the 
contribution of one conformal multiplet in that four point function. So you can think of that as, as taking these operators and inserting between x12 and, and between this pair and this pair, inserting a projector onto the conformal multiplet with dimension delta n spin L. Um, this projector, if you'd like, you can think of it as another type of surface operator. And uh, because it's a projector onto a conformal multiplet, it by construction commutes with the conformal generators. If you project onto an irreducible multiplet, that, that commutes with the, with, with the symmetry generators. Um, and so what that means is that this object, even though it looks a little bit weird, satisfies all the same word identities as a four-point function. So if we were to start inserting conformal charges in different places, um, uh, we can move them around and deform them and go move them right through this projection operator and it doesn't care about them. So this thing satisfies all the same word identities as a four-point function and therefore is a function of conformal cross ratios. Questions? Um, good. So this point of view actually leads to a nice way to compute what these conformal blocks are. Um, a way that's a lot more efficient than, so we could do it in principle by finding all the terms in this power series um, by matching this uh, three-point function um, and then applying these terms, expanding out and, and trying to figure out what we get. Um, and this is indeed what was originally done in the 70s. Um, for uh, a few simple cases of conformal blocks. Um, but there's a really nice trick due to Dolan and Osborne um, from the early 2000s. And I think of it as being really recent, but I guess it's almost 20 years old now. Um, so uh, the idea is to um, think about this picture um, and um, uh, consider the, the casimir of the conformal group. So just a, a, little, a little aside on the conformal algebra. So I claimed a couple lectures ago that the conformal algebra was S of D plus 1, 1. And specifically, you can, you can write the generators in terms of the ones that we define. Um, so uh, L mu nu is M mu nu. L minus 1, 0 is D. L 0 mu is 1 half E mu plus K mu. L minus 1 mu is 1 half e mu minus k mu. So exercise, convince yourself that these satisfy the algebra of uh, S of u plus 1, 1. Um, and uh, then one could define a Casimir, which is minus 1 half L a b L a b. Where here I raise and lower the indices using the metric appropriate to R d plus 1 comma 1. Um, and this Casimir has the property that it commutes with all the conformal generators. Um, and also its eigenvalue on, uh, on any state in a conformal multiplet, um, in, a, in a fixed conformal multiplet, uh, is as follows. So it has some eigenvalue lambda, and lambda is uh, delta times delta minus d plus l times l plus d minus 2. Um, and the nice thing about the Casimir is uh, uh, it's the same when acting on any state in the multiplet. So here I wrote it for the primary, but it's, it's, uh, it acts in the same way on any descendant of O. Yes. Yes. I think you just recombine it and suddenly the algebra, the the sign of that algebra change. Is it really equivalent to the original one? 
Yeah, good. So I'm working in Euclidean space. So the Euclidean conformal algebra is, uh, is SOD plus 1 comma 1. Um, the Lorentzian algebra is indeed uh, SOD comma 2. And that has to do with the fact that when you, um, uh, when you wick rotate to Lorentzian signature, you um, naturally want to introduce vectors of i uh, in your generators, and then you'll change the, uh, uh, change the real form of the algebra. Um, good. So we have this uh, conformal chasm here, and remember also the first couple lectures we spent describing how the action of conformal generators can be written in terms of differential operators. And here let me just define some slightly different notation for them. Um, the differential operator corresponding to LAB uh, is this curly LAB. So for example, uh, if we take Translations, this is just DU. OK, so we can use these things uh, to write down an eigenvalue equation for the conformal block. So uh, on the one hand, on one side of the equation, we have the uh, eigenvalue of the conformal Casimir times the stuff. And this is equal to our picture. where we insert outside this projector the Casimir. And the reason is that once we've projected onto a conformal multiplet with dimension delta n spin L, the Casimir acts with this eigenvalue, no matter what, what state it's acting on. Okay? So this, this is clearly true. But I said that the projector commutes with all the conformal generators, so we can pull the Casimir inside. So when we pull it inside, um, it then acts on these individual operators, and we can replace its action on the operators with these differential operators. So pulling this inside, um, we get minus 1 half times now the differential operator LAB acting on point 1 plus the differential operator LAB acting on point 2 times LAB acting on point 1 plus LAB acting on point 2. Um, all acting on G delta L of U and B over x12 to the 2 delta phi, x34 to the 2 delta phi. Okay, so these are some differential operators whose form we know. They're, they're each individually is a first order differential operator. So altogether we get um, that G delta L of U and B satisfies some second order differential equation. Yes? So what happens in Yeah, okay, so maybe, maybe I was a little bit fast. So let's bring C inside. And let's just look, focus on uh, point, point one and two. And then let me let me split C A B into two. I'll split the Casimir into two pieces. So I'll have uh, one one uh, insertion of uh, L A B, and then another insertion of uh, L A B. And this first guy I can deform so that it's just surrounding each individual operator. And this gives me a sum of uh, the uh, differential operator acting at point 1 plus the differential operator acting at point 2. So that's what this interior picture is. And then you can do the same thing for the other thing. So yeah, it's, it's a little bit tricky. So, so the, um, uh, whenever you have algebra-like symmetry generators, then pictures of multiple circles mean you're summing. When you have group-like symmetry generators, pictures with multiple circles mean you're multiplying. And this is a quadratic thing, so you need to be a little bit more careful. But uh, uh, this is what you get. 
Um, and of course, g just depends on the cross ratios, so we can rewrite this, this thing just in terms of cross ratios. And it's equal to some explicit differential operator that only depends on the cross ratios times g delta l of u and b. Um, and I'll, I'll write the differential operator so you can stare at it, but we, we won't really need it. Explicit form. Okay, so it's most nicely written in terms of z and z bar, and remember, z and z bar are related to u and v by following. Okay, so we have some explicit differential equation, and all we have to do is solve it. Um, and uh, to solve the differential equation, we need a boundary condition. Um, but we actually already computed the boundary condition um, by just looking at the leading term uh, in the OPE. So that was this exercise up here. You can see, for example, in the case of a scalar that g delta 0 of x of i starts with u to the delta over 2. And that's a good enough boundary condition for solving this differential equation. Um, and uh, good, so this is, this is a uh, an efficient way to compute the blocks. Um, and one can recover, in this case, a, a well-known old result for the conformable blocks in, uh, in 2D. So they look like this. Well, the function appearing here is a hypergeometric function. Um, and this hypergeometric function actually plays a really important role uh, in the bootstrap. Um, it's, uh, it's essentially the conformal block associated to um, uh, the group of conformal transformations in one dimension. Um, and the reason is that the conformal group in 2D splits, um, splits into two factors, SL2 cross SL2, um, and the conformal blocks in 2D factorize. Um, so this is the conformal block associated with the one SL2 factor. Um, and as we'll hopefully see later, um, that actually can have significance even in higher dimensional theories. There are different kinematics that um, isolate some, one particular SL2 that's particularly important, and then these hypergeometric functions will show up all over the place. Um, but this is, this is an old result that, that uh, people have arrived at by a variety of means. Um, but one of the nice things that Dolan and Osborne did is they showed that this equation could actually be solved um, in uh, higher even dimensions and it has, the, the solution has a, has a beautiful form. In terms of these same SL2 blocks. And I think it's fair to say that no one really understands why, why it has such a beautiful form. Um, why it should have such a beautiful form. I mean, you can just explicitly uh, solve this equation um, as they did, um, but uh, I, couldn't get, I couldn't explain it to my grandmother why it was so nice. Uh, any questions? You, you so far focused on blocks with external scalar operators. Yes. Uh, are there generalizations to external? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, uh, yeah, there are generalizations to external operators with spin, um, and um, 
when there are external operators with spin, um, you have to contend with the fact that there are multiple three-point structures that can appear. Um, uh, and so the conformal block is then parameterized by a three-point structure on the left and the three-point structure on the right. And the conformal Casimir equation in general becomes a complicated uh, system of second-order PEDs. Um, and uh, that's actually quite difficult to solve. So people have invented other methods of trying to compute spinning conformal blocks. So there are no general results like this one? Um, well, yes, there are. I mean, um, for for different types of representations, uh, you can write down formulas like this. Um, for specific choices. For, for specific choices, yeah. Um, that's right. I think the nicest, the nicest uh, results come from, um, uh, there are by now systematic methods for writing spinning conformal blocks as derivatives of scalar blocks. Um, so in particular, uh, that lets you leverage the dolan Osborne result in four dimensions to write down formulas for spinning blocks in terms of these nice factor geometric functions. And that gives you closed forms for these? Suppose yes. I, I see. Yeah. So uh, uh, on the other hand, um, uh, in odd dimensions, uh, there are no known uh, expressions in terms of elementary functions. So the conformal blocks in odd dimensions um, are a little bit more complicated pieces to deal with. Um, and in practice, for doing computations, um, they're either computed numerically or computed in some kinematic limit where they simplify. And we'll, we'll probably talk a little bit about that later. Um, or if you're interested in studying some particular physics that involves the blocks, you can sometimes get away with just the Casimir equation and not the explicit form of the blocks. Other questions? What about 60? Yeah, so, so there's a recursion relation that um, lets you relate blocks in d dimensions to blocks in d minus 2 dimensions. And you can then apply it to, to this if you like and uh, generate relatively nice expressions in 60. Um, so the expressions in 60 are again in terms of these SL2 blocks, and now you have some slightly different rational factors. Okay, so we use the OP to compute a four-point function, as I promised we should be able to do. Um, but there's something a little bit funny about this expression. So the thing that we found is that g of u and b is the sum over operators O, three-point coefficient squared times conformal block. Um, the funny thing about this expression is that the way we computed the four-point function um, singled out some particular pair of operators. Um, but we were looking at a four-point function of identical operators, and uh, you might remember that in an earlier lecture I said that this thing should be invariant under permutations of the points. So in particular, it was supposed to satisfy this equation, which comes from swapping one and two. Um, and this equation from swapping 1 and 3. Um, and it's not completely obvious that this expression satisfies the, these conditions. Um, so it actually turns out that uh, this one is not too bad. So this is actually true. <coughs> block by block. Um, so that's, this is a non-obvious symmetry of the conformal blocks. And I encourage you to check it for these explicit formulas. Give it a try. Um, and the thing that you'll need here is that L is even. Uh, this equation, on the other hand, is not manifest. <coughs> uh, certainly not manifest block by block, and it's it's also pretty complicated to understand from this expression. 
Uh, and this, um, this, is the, this equation together with this expression is what we'll be uh, trying to understand for the rest of my lectures. Is there a reason it's true block by block, a priori? Yes, so um, the reason it's a little bit hard to see um, uh, uh, in the way I described the blocks is that we're using, um, we're using a bad uh, conformal frame. Um, so there's a, there's a different conformal frame that you can choose that makes it completely manifest that this is true. Um, and the idea is to treat, um, treat the points a little bit more symmetrically. So we can put three and four on the unit circle, and one and two diametrically opposite around the origin. Um, this is another choice, of, an alternative choice of conformal frame that you can always pick. Um, and uh, this gives the conformal blocks as a function of uh, this coordinate rho, this compass coordinate rho, and they're manifestly an even expansion in rho uh, for even L. Um, and the, this transformation, which looks a little bit complicated in terms of what you would be, is just rho goes to minus rho. Okay, so that's one, one solution to the exercises that I, exercise I encourage you to do, but it's also interesting to think about in terms of uh, the DNC form. Okay, um, <coughs> wow. Uh, ten? <laughs> okay. Um, Okay, so this equation that we get from swapping one and three is not at all clear from the uh, from the conformal block expansion, um, and the reason is that it requires um, some strong conditions on the data of the conformal field theory, the dimensions uh, and OP coefficients. Um, and one way to phrase it is that the OPE should be associative. So if we do the OPE between 1 and 2, and then between the result and 3, this should be the same thing as doing the OPE in a different order, say between 2 and 3, and then 1 and the result. Um, and um, uh, if you take a correlator of this equation with a fourth operator, um, you get what's called the, the crossing equation. And the crossing equation says that if you compute a four-point function by taking the OPE of 1 and 2, and looking at, the things that, looking at the things that are exchanged, then you should get the same result as if you compute the four-point function by doing the OPE in a different way. Okay, so OPE associativity and the crossing equation um, are equivalent to each other. Um, and what this means is actually if you if you could establish that all four-point functions satisfy this type of symmetry property, that is, if all four-point functions satisfy the crossing equation, then that implies that the operator product expansion is associative, because these two things are equivalent, and that implies that any way of computing any endpoint function will give you the same answer. So if someone comes up to you and and, and they you know they open their jacket and want to buy a CFT, and they have like a list of dimensions and OP coefficients, um, you should check um, that they satisfy crossing symmetry. That's the non-trivial thing. And if they do, then you know that it's a legitimate CFT. It's not going to open. <laughs> yeah, you'd be surprised. Um, but this is, actually, this is actually an incredibly surprising thing, or at, at, at least it certainly was for me when I first learned about it. It means that you can try to define a conformal field theory in terms of just a list of numbers satisfying this consistency condition. And that's way simpler than most definitions of quantum field theory that you come across. Um, so it, it somehow drastically simplifies the problem of understanding what a field theory is. And it's amazing that you can get this far using symmetries. Um, and I should say that um, this is uh, almost good enough for defining the quantum field theory. It depends on your standards. So if you have this data and it satisfies crossing symmetry, then that means you have a complete set of consistent 
correlation functions, endpoint correlation functions in flat space. Um, but you might have higher standards and you might be interested in computing other types of observables like correlators on uh, manifolds other than flat space. Um, and in that case, you can run into additional consistency conditions. The most famous of which is modular invariance for 2D CFTs, which is something that does not follow from, from crossing symmetry um, of, uh, of the local operators. Um, it's an additional thing you have to check. Um, and the analogs of modular invariance um, in higher dimensions are not really very well understood. And it's certainly not understood how they're related to just this list of numbers. So you should be a little, still a little bit uneasy about buying the CFT from that guy. Um, because there may be consistency conditions that we understand in the future that, uh, that they fail. Um, but for now, this is, uh, this is already a pretty amazingly simple characterization of a field theory. The conformal blocks that you've talked about, yes. do they form a basis for certain class of functions of cross ratios? Yeah. Is, this, is there a class of functions of cross ratios such that any re, any member of that class can be written as a linear sum of these conformal blocks? Um, I'm, I'm not sure what a simple characterization of that class of functions is. I don't, I don't really know. Um, so if there is a statement that um, any uh, any single valued function um, uh, on Euclidean space, it's a function of two cross ratios, can be expanded as an integral of conformal blocks along the principal series. So an integral of conformal blocks where the dimensions are equal to this, where, where s is a real number. Um, so there's always some uh, set of coefficient functions you can find where you can write the four-point function as, a sum, as an integral of these things. There's a separate question of whether you can take that integral and deform the contour around the real line and then pick up individual poles on the real line. Um, so the condition for that is that the coefficients on the principal series form a meromorphic function that dies off in infinity in this direction and just has simple poles. I don't know how to phrase that directly in terms of the four point function, but maybe it could be done. Okay. Good, so we're almost ready to start bootstrapping. And I just need to mention um, one additional type of consistency condition um, that we should have in mind, um, which is uh, unitarity or reflection positivity. So um, let me first say what reflection positivity is. So consider. Um, an operator in a Lorentzian theory. So, so let me just say, we're going to be interested in um, Euclidean theories that can be obtained by width rotation from a unitary Lorentzian theory. Um, and theories that are obtained by width rotation from a unitary Lorentzian theory um, inherit some nice properties from that theory. And one of those properties is reflection positivity. So let's consider a Lorentzian operator. And I'm going to suppress uh, the space directions for the moment and just talk about the time directions. So this operator uh, at some time t um, is equal to e to the i h t times the same operator at time 0 in the minus i h t. Um, and we can rotate to Euclidean signature and define a Euclidean operator at some Euclidean time is just the Lorentzian operator evaluated at minus i times the Euclidean time. And this is e to the h to Euclidean uh, over Lorentzian of 0 is minus h to Euclidean. OK, so let's suppose that our Lorentzian operator is a Hermitian operator.
So in particular, that means that uh, it's Hermitian at any Lorenzian time. And you can check that, just take the, uh, um, just take the Hermitian conjugate of this expression and use the fact that the Hamiltonian is Hermitian. Um, but this means something a little bit funny for the Euclidean operator. So if we take the Hermitian conjugate of our Euclidean expression, we find that its conjugate is the same operator at minus t Euclidean. So Hermitian conjugation involves a flip in the time direction. Um, okay, so one of the important conditions coming from unitarity is that norms should be positive. Um, so let's compute the norm of a state created by one of these Euclidean operators. Let's think about acting with this operator on the vacuum. So the norm is then this correlation function. So it's an overlap between uh, the operator at one time and the operator at some reflected time. And this has to be bigger than or equal to zero. And in general, the condition that we find is that if we, act, if we have a state created by some collection of operators, um, and we take a correlator that involves um, this same collection of operators uh, in a mirror configuration, then this thing had better be greater than or equal to zero. So this is just the Euclidean version of uh, positivity of norms. Um, and this is why, you can see from the picture, why it's called reflection positivity. And reflection positivity gives us some extra useful information about this data. And you should probably ask the guy whether this is true as well. So we can Think about, let's say, a two-point function. So remember, this is, I said earlier, this is some constant over x minus y, the two delta. Um, and no matter where these points are, we can always draw, we can always divide space into two pieces such that the points are reflections of each other around that, uh, around that plane. Um, and so that implies that this thing had better be positive. And so this coefficient had better be positive. Um, and in fact, the norm can only be, uh, be zero if the state is literally zero. So that means as long as this isn't the zero operator, uh, this thing had better be strictly positive. OK, so that's uh, one result that has been alluded to a few times. Um, we can get something a little bit more interesting by considering uh, descendants, descendant operators. So let's look at a reflection symmetric configuration, and here let's put a derivative in the one direction of O at some positive time t, and a derivative in the one direction of O at minus t. Okay, so um, what is this? So this is dx1, dx2, 1 over I guess it would be 2t squared plus x1 minus x2 squared to the delta. Um, and we want to consider the reflection symmetric configuration so that we'll set x1 equal to 0 and x2 equal to 0. OK, so exercise for next time. Compute this and see and conclude something. Um, and I'll stop there. Yes. Can you take the conformal block at a given real delta and expand it in a in an integral over your principal value conformal? Um. Yeah. So if if you take a conformal block in one channel and expand it in the principal series in that in that same channel, um, it's uh, um, 
uh, it's actually, that is not guaranteed to make sense. And the reason is that an individual conformal block is not single value in Euclidean space. Uh, it has a branch cut. Um, because the dimensions are not necessarily um, infinite. No, the, the, uh, right. So that, that's, so there's a branch that's starting at one. So um, uh, it is single value near the origin. That's perfectly fine. Um, but it's not single value um, because there's a branch that's starting at one. Um, and you actually need an infinite sum of blocks uh, to get something that's single value. Um, but, um, uh, yeah. 